And um, since we're just looking at that one location at that point, is that's when we can really focus in on gathering more detailed data for that site. Welcome back to another episode of the Shared Practices podcast. My co-host today, Dr. Jonas Ashbaugh, interviews Kent Miller from Dentographics. Now, for those of you who may have listened to the podcast or know a little bit about my background, I'm a big demographics junkie. I really like getting into the weeds and a little bit nerdy subject of dental demographics. And so in the outro today, I'll break down my thoughts on demographics as they pertain to startups. Um, But this is definitely a great interview. Jonas does a great job with Kent and definitely a lot of info in here. So listen up and we'll go ahead and cut straight to the interview with Kent Miller and Dr. Jonas Ashbaugh. Welcome to another episode of Shared Practices. My name is Dr. Jonas Ashbaugh. Today we have a special guest, Mr. Kent Miller. He's the president of Dentographics. You may have heard of his company if you're ever interested in looking for uh, demographics uh, pertaining to doing a startup and maybe even buying an existing practice to see the saturation in the area and to find out what the competition is like. Um, today we have one to discuss what demographics are, what do you want to look for, and how do you find the right location. So welcome, Ken. Thank you, Jonas. Hey, not a problem. So about demogra- uh, dentographics, how do you guys get your information? Let's start there. Sure. So um, there are two types of information that go into our reports. The first is demographic data. And that information for everyone is originally sourced from the Census Bureau. Now, the census obviously only conducts a full census um, every 10 years. Uh, There's a lot of talk right now of of the 2020 census, and um, that's kind of been in the news. So in the meantime, um, there is what's called the American Community Survey, which, again, is um, conducted by the Census Bureau. It's sort of their in-between um, estimates uh, so that they are providing updated data uh, rather than every 10 years. They're doing it, um, I believe now, actually every year. Um, we subscribe to private data providers which uh, specialize in updating data at the smallest scale possible. And and when I'm talking about data right now, I mean demographic data every single year. Um, The smallest scale that the Census Bureau generally considers to be a reliable scale. Uh, Remember that the Census Bureau, even though they give hard numbers, really they're conducting um, estimates um, and they don't track individual citizens and how many people live in a particular home. Um, but they, uh, the smallest scale that they consider to be reliable uh, or generally reliable is the block group. And there's typically about a few thousand people in each block group. Um, so that data comes from uh, a couple of private data providers every single year at the block group level. Um, and then for our competition numbers, Um, We have a couple of databases which we compile into one larger list, Um, and then we have a team of researchers go through that list of competitors and verify for each doctor that we work with uh, the practices that are in the list in their area. Um, So not only are we looking to make sure that they're open and that they're at the correct location that we have on file uh, and that we don't have the doctor's home address or um, a doctor that's working in a a facility that would not be competitive with that practice, um, such as outside of the specialty. Um, So if you're a general dentist, uh, we are eliminating endodontists and periodontists, for instance, from the list of competitors. Um, Vice versa, if, if you're a periodontist, um, we're not counting general dentists as competition in your search. Okay, so you, you drew it down down pretty good. How do you get the demographics for the specific dentists in the area? Is that is that all manually, or is that in those lists that you gather? Um, so what we look at um, is we'll start with the lists that we've gathered. Um, and verified. And then once we've verified 
uh, the practices in a given area, we will then have our team also look at, and really it's more of a general characterization. We're not, um, at, at least we're not yet, I hope to one day, looking at, uh, for instance, the, the age of a, a specific doctor. Um, but we do characterize practices um, as far as uh, are, do they seem to be smaller offices without websites um, that might be smaller locations in the back of like a professional center? So essentially, did our did our research t- team have a hard time finding these practices? So what kind of competition is this? If our research team couldn't really find this location very easily, that may not be quite the same level of competitor as um, a big practice with uh, a big marketing budget right on the corner of two main rows. So you're doing, in essence, like a competitive analysis, correct? Correct. How far do you drill that down exactly? Are you call, you're calling the offices? Are you able to report on uh, how they answer the phone, how they, like how long it takes to get a new patient in? Are you drilling it down to, to that level or just, just the characterization of the office itself? So we look at primarily digital marketing strategies and um, how these offices look online. So how many Google reviews do these practices have and what do those Google reviews look like? What is their rating? Uh, Same with Yelp, Yelp reviews and ratings. Um, Then we also look at Facebook likes, Twitter followers. And then the last one is the estimated Google AdWords spend. Um, And that's something that um, we're using a reverse algorithm to calculate. So it's uh, primarily digital. But again, we do look at how far away from the proposed location uh, a practice is. Is it one mile away or is it 10 miles away? And then again, do they do they have a website? Does it look modern or do they seem kind of like a smaller office? Um, and some of that is a little bit more qualitative than quantitative. Um, but we do make observations about both. But I think it's powerful. I think that you still need to do, um, you know, even though an area may on paper seem competitive or, 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 or saturated, um, being able to drill down to those competitive features um, is powerful. And I, and I still, I think it definitely needs to be done if you're looking for that home run location. I mean, like I listed calling, calling the practice, finding out, how are you on the phone? You know, did it put you on hold? Uh, how how soon can they get a new patient in? How soon? Yeah, how soon can they book you for new patient ex- uh, exam? Are they scheduling with the doctor, with the hygienist? Like all those things can tell you a lot about how sophisticated practices and how how saturated they are with, with patients. Correct. Yeah, and and we do always recommend um, you know some of that info uh, is challenging for us to report in a reliable manner. And we do always recommend that kind of research, though, and, and going or taking those extra steps to beyond what we say, really conduct as much homework or do as much homework as you can about an area and, and who your competition is. Um, one thing that I'll say that since you kind of touched on it is that the number of practices I think everyone knows um, is not really the same as how competitive is an area. Um, So one interesting thing that we've observed is that uh, practices in markets that are a little bit older and maybe not growing as much, you tend to find these um, in the Northeast and the Midwest. The doctors also tend to be maybe a little bit older. Um, And so we might say, hey, this market looks pretty competitive from purely a saturation standpoint, just on paper. Um, But what makes sense, of course, if the population has gotten older, well, the doctors are a a part of that population. And we tend to see that a lot of the practices do look a little bit older as well. Um, They tend to, or they tend to um, be a little bit less likely to have websites um, and really just maintaining their online presence. Um, So certainly something that has been an interesting finding and and we recommend that you consider if, if you're thinking about either a startup or an acquisition. I think that's a little, little nugget right there. Um, I have to agree. I think that if you can, if you think about a startup and, and like, like you said, you're surrounded by these older practices. If you come in there with a new mentality, 
a new modern facility, you've got some technology and you can market well, you can compete. I think there's opportunity there that, that may not present itself on paper. So yeah, I think you're right. Um, we, we posted this question on, on our Facebook group just recently. And we asked, um, you know, what's the most important variable for a startup? And I want to know what your insight would be. And uh, do you think it's visibility for practice or the demographic that you're in? Wow. Or, 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 demo, or uh, population ratio, dentist to, to, de- to population. Okay. So your three most common responses, it sounds like, were competition, demographics, and visibility. Yeah, which one is you know which one is uh, more important? The visibility, you know, being front and center, maybe in a saturated area, or you know, home run location that may be tucked away in an unsaturated area. We mm-hmm. have we have to tell people where you're at, and they they can't readily find you off the street. Mm-hmm. Well, let me say that all three are certainly important. Even when even in our reports, um, when we deliver them, we know that we can't model perfectly a a given market. Um, Just like nobody can really predict an election, despite how much infinite research goes into and how much effort is is put into um, trying to figure out who might win an election, we can't fully completely model a market. So um, there are definitely things to consider um, outside of our report, which would be things like how well can you be seen from the street? And that's something that can be quantified in some ways, but in others is more of um, uh, a variable that's observable um, while you're on the ground. In my opinion, the most important of those three is saturation. Now, saturation does, it's not a, a, there's not one benchmark for saturation. So a number that gets thrown around a lot is um, 2,000 to one. And 2,000 residents um, per dentist or per, per dental office. That number needs to be adjusted though. So um, based off of the demographics of the area, are you in a really high income market um, where there's really strong demand for dental care or a really large market um, where the, the size or the total amount of dental care is really large? Or are you in a, a relatively low income area um, where demand may not be as strong or a really small market, um, where tiny little changes in that community, whether dental specific, like new practices opening up or, um, outside of the dental market, like the town's major employer closing down or, or moving a few towns over can really have a big effect on that town's economy and, and thus the success of your practice. So there's a lot of factors and I, I don't want to, Maybe this sounds like a disclaimer. I don't want to roll it all into just one particular thing. I would vote saturation, though. Okay. I, I can see that. So you're saying that if you know where Amazon 2 is going to be, the new headquarters is going to be put, it may be saturated there, but there might be some opportunity for, you know, uh, a lot of growth because, you know, a really good employer is going to come in town, provide a lot of jobs. So uh, it could be some opportunity right there. Yeah. And, and you know, to think of kind of a, a lower density – situation. Um, if you're the only practice for 30 or 40 miles around, you may not have to have phenomenal visibility. In really dense locations, like you would find in uh, the New York area, for instance, the, a lot of the practices really rely on, and the New York area is so different from what you see in areas that where people or regions are more auto-centric and people drive around more. Um, a lot of the practices in those areas really focus on visibility um, because they're looking, they're getting patients from people who are walking by um, and are out on the street. Uh, so I think it's somewhat market dependent as well, but the, we do see a lot of situations. I won't necessarily say that there's comparably more opportunity um, in uh, uh every rule market that you look at, but we do certainly find situations where doctors find um, a small town where uh, they might be the only practice for a really, really long time. Um, and they're the closest practice to 30 or 30,000 people. So there can certainly be opportunity that way too. Are you able to rank um, the difference in competition between a private practice 
and a a corporate practice? Would would you differentiate between the two? Would you say that one is better than the other in terms of saturation? Does that make sense? They have their pros and cons. There's a little bit of trade-off for both. So I think partially it depends on your practice strategy. Um, and if you are competing directly against that corporate practice or so if you're competing directly against this practice and let's assume that the corporate practice and a private practice are otherwise the same, we would generally prefer the private practice because of the scale. Um, we prefer that you're competing against the private practice because of, for instance, their ability to absorb a loss, their ability to shell out a lot of money for marketing um, is obviously much stronger when the money is coming from um, a private equity fund, for instance, as opposed to an individual doctor. Now, if you're differentiated, I think there is a lot of opportunity to differentiate from corporate dentistry. Um, and that's been the experience of a lot of doctors that we've worked with that have been in corporate dentistry, um, is that they find that they're able to work with, and sometimes even in very close proximity to corporate practices, but able to work with kind of a different patient base or a patient base that is not as interested in working with uh, a corporate practice or, or going to a corporate practice. No, I have to agree. I think that um, you can you can make yourself different um, from the corporate practice that's down the street. And I, I'm I had that situation, and uh, and I don't feel it. I don't I don't feel the competition there. You know, it seems like the corporate practices they don't. I'm sure they do their demographic research. I no no doubt they do, um, but they don't seem to care what practices are there. Um, <laughs> um, you see that they just open a practice in, in my mind would be a, a terrible idea with what's around them. But uh, just, just the, the factor that they have lots of money have other people paying for it, that, that they can do it. They can throw their weight around and, and, and step in there. But I think that it's also a disadvantage too, because they're, they're kind of putting themselves in a, in a bad situation where they, they may not be able to compete in the same way with an established private practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we find um, and we work with um, the full spectrum of dental practices. Do you work uh, with any corporate offices? We do. Most of our clientele is individual doctors um, or small groups. Um, I think that reflects mostly, though, on the nature of the industry. Um, but we do certainly work with larger groups and, and some corporate practices as well. Um, and we typically find that what they're looking for is more along the lines of density and visibility and how large a market is and what the potential for that site is rather than, and this may reflect on their ability to not have to recover their investment right away necessarily, um, like a single doctor might have to. Um, but they're looking for the, the biggest market with the most potential and kind of swinging for the fences a little bit more often than um, the safer bet where uh, there might be fewer practices around, um, but not as quite as um, large of a market. Um, and that's where we tend to see the, the smaller practices. Most of them like to start out with at least. Um, of course, that doesn't speak for everybody, but just kind of a general difference between the, the two categories. Okay. That, that's a good summation right there. Uh, I like that. So what are you finding? Like what's the, well, I guess it's, it's a common question. So for a private dentist, um, they're a little more nimble. They can, as, as we, you were talking about them versus a corporate office, um, what are they looking for in a location? What, what are the common things that, that a private office is looking for or, or should be looking for in the perfect demographic report? Mm -hmm. So, what we recommend, in addition, obviously, to competition, um, is that that level of competition is adjusted for similar communities with respect to geographic context. So a, an example of that that I had started to or sort of talked about a little bit earlier was that a 2,000 to 1 ratio from a, a patient to or residents per dental office perspective, uh, can be very different whether you're in a really high income, really densely populated market 
um, versus a on the opposite end of that spectrum, um, a low density, low income market. And most areas are somewhere in between those two. Um, so what we do um, and what I think uh, the goal of market analysis is, is to help understand the trade offs um, between the demographics of an area and its level of competition. Um, it's relatively, I would say the easier part of what we do is collecting the data. The more challenging part and the more valuable part is interpreting the data um, and helping uh, doctors understand what the numbers mean relative to similar areas uh, as far as demographics and density um, and what we think they might be able to find within um, their market of interest. Uh, if you're in a really, really competitive market like Southern California, you're probably never going to find an area that's 4,000 residents per dental office, uh, at least. A lot of listeners hearts right there. <laughs> but you might find that in Texas or Florida um, or in some of the markets that are uh, a little bit less competitive. Um, there was a, a comment that I read on a forum uh, a while back that I really like, and, and I'd like to cite the person who made it. I don't remember who it was, but um, they were helping to explain that a lot of people, and dentists included, want to live near mountains and the ocean and major international airports. And, and so we tend to find that those are the really competitive areas. If you look in areas that might not have some of those same amenities, and it's a trade-off. Um, I'm certainly not suggesting that you move somewhere that's going to make you miserable. Um, but it is a trade-off between some of those amenities and uh, the level of competition. And um, we do tend to find lower levels of competition. Uh, and again, this is somewhat a function of um, the trade-offs between density and competition. But in suburban areas, exurban areas, and, and particularly away from the major, major cities. As doctors considering a new practice, especially a first practice, we tend to focus on a few key points, often at the expense of others. We worry about how we're going to pay for the construction, how to staff it, and how we're going to fill it with patients. With all these critical elements fighting for our attention, it's easy to forget that a practice is a system. It has a flow. Patients come in, are treated, and checked out. Rooms are stocked and restocked. Instruments are processed. Establishing how all these different activities will work together is critically important to the success of a startup. And it needs to happen early in the design process because fixing it later may not be an option. Understanding this whole practice approach is why we asked Design Ergonomics to join us as a sponsor. Design Ergonomics was founded by Dr. David Ahern, a practicing dentist, noted lecturer, and a frequent contributor to the ADA's Guide to the Dental Office Design. For over 20 years, Design Ergonomics has been designing, equipping, and training some of the nation's most successful practices. One of the many things that sets Design Ergonomics apart is how they start the design process. Looking at a potential space, whether existing or new construction, they work with you to develop a conceptual outline of your practice. This initial drawing, called a blocking diagram, lays out all the elements of your final office in a way that is easy to visualize and can quickly be adjusted to suit your vision. Using screen sharing meetings, their design team will walk you through changes and explain key elements, impact a practice's productivity, and allow for future growth. Blocking diagrams are low-cost tools that can determine how or if the space you're looking at will fit your goals. To learn more about blocking diagrams and other services Design Ergonomics offers, go to www.desergo.com. Enter promo code shared BD as in blocking diagrams on the contact page to receive a $250 discount off of a blocking diagram for a limited time. Again, that's www.desergo.com. Do, do you follow any dentists that you have helped uh, find, you know, the location uh, with your reports? Um, yeah, so we do, we do, um, in a way, um, we don't track the success of individual practices over time, but what we do, 
um, is, or what we have developed uh, is a fairly sizable base of uh, repeat customers um, who have over time not only helped us fine tune our formulas and um, what to look for, um, but also have um, provided feedback and helped to provide a little bit of um, an idea behind the success of their practices um, relative to the market. So when Do you we give them rank, an idea of what type of practice would, would prosper in a location that you're suggesting? Yes. And, and the other thing is that, so let's say there's a, a group that's got five practices and they don't tell us what um, or how well each of those practices are doing. Um, they'll have us assess the markets for those five locations and then we'll meet back up and they'll say, okay, uh, these two are doing really well. These two are doing pretty good. And then this last one is sort of not doing quite as, as strongly as the others. Um, and so then we'll try and find uh, what's going on in the, in the markets and, and maybe we can explain it with the markets or maybe it's something that is unique to those practices. Maybe, maybe somebody doesn't like the doctor at one of those practices or uh, maybe the community is a little bit different and they need different um, availability weekend appointments. Um, so yeah, we, we do work, uh, I would say, kind of in a, an informal way, we track how the how our reports have helped practices, um, but there isn't necessarily like uh, once you've bought a report from us, you know, you're in a tracking system and, and we count your finances or something. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's good. Well, yeah, that's good. No, do you have a lot of overlap of, of potential customers with, with your reports? In certain areas, you know, if you want to locate in um, a really high growth market and a really or a really rapidly developing area in a really high growth market, the chances are that I, I've probably assessed that market in the past for uh, a potential competitor. Um, and obviously they don't always open up. Uh, in the locations that we look at, but yes, we, we certainly do have certain markets that at, um, particular times have been, um, very active for us. What do you say you have this guess, guess again, kind of personal, but, uh, what do you say you have more, what's your demographic of customer, I guess, is it in, in terms of, um, I guess male female ratio. Is there more males opening practices or more females opening practices? I guess I want to ask that. Yeah, it's. I would say it's pretty split actually, and uh, I know that that's been one of the big topics in um, the dental industry for a while now. Has been the changing demographics of dental providers, dentists themselves in particular. Other than the roughly even gender split. Most of our clients, certainly not all, but most are um, towards the beginning of their career. They've been out of school for a few years and have been associates now and have paid down a little bit of their debt and ready to take on some more. But we do work with, um, as I said, a lot of groups as well. And of course, some of the founders of those practices uh, are, are more mid-career. Okay. That makes sense. I lost my mind here. Oh, are you able to connect? Connect them to real estate agents. Is that is that a service you guys provide, or, yeah, or, look, so, or look at commercial sites in the areas too? So when um, so we work nationwide, and a lot of the site selection process is usually done on a local level. So we're kind of in a unique position where um, we do know a lot of real estate agents across the country. We don't help uh on the ground in that aspect so we're not you know we're, we're not receiving commissions from a real estate transaction um but we do have a lot of contacts and that's that's been a strength for us as well um because real estate agents also they want to they come to us and say i've got a client who wants this and that um x and y criteria can you help them narrow down their search um, so we work with them in both directions, 
Um, and we also help them assess particular locations for their clients. Um, so we have a lot of contacts that way. Um, again, we don't negotiate leases ourselves. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, but, but we but, can. But, but I think that's the that's important though. Like once you find your, dem- your once you find that that the area of opportunity, that the area that's not saturated, and you, you see, you know, you outline that you know there's so many square miles needs a dentist has a need for you. Uh, next step is identifying the commercial real estate and, and what's available because uh, the, the two may not line up. Mm-hmm. And so our um, we offer a couple of different reports, but the initial, the very first one for somebody who says, hey, I live in this area where I'm interested in opening a practice in this general area. Maybe it's the greater Nashville area or the greater Austin area. You know, where should I be looking? Um, once we produce that report, um, and, and the way that we do that is we pull data for um, as far as demographics as well as competition for um, sub-markets across that entire region, then we'll make a couple of recommendations and we'll say, here are two, three, maybe even four markets where we would focus um, the search. But the other half of site selection um, is what kinds of properties are available? Um, what's the what are the visibility of or what what is the visibility on the ground of those locations look like? How is parking at some of those locations in in urban contexts that can be a challenge? Um, what does signage look like? What's it going to cost to get into that location? And what's your build out potential? Um, and that may not always line up perfectly with the findings of market analysis. So the number one market may not have the number one property in it. And we recommend and and we advise that um, you balance the two and that uh, hopefully we can find a a market that is favorable relative to the region. And we can also find a a strong property within that market. And that's usually the the way that it goes. Um, Sometimes it, it can be more challenging than others. Um, but certainly we, uh, the balance is important. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think so. I mean, that's, that's the key right there. Um, you know, finding out what's available. Um, and, and then, and then, like you said, is there something available, um, in the market that you found? Uh, I'm looking at your different reports here. So you have an area analysis and that, that basically gives you a, we say a broader scope, like a, it kind of gives you an idea of what's in uh, that area. Could, could you break down your three reports here? Yeah. So the area analysis is where we cast that wide net and we say, um, okay, you're interested in this larger region. Where should you be looking within this market for real estate? And this is this is step one. Then once we've identified a couple of submarkets, we'd recommend you go and, and look at properties, typically with a real estate agent, so that they can help you not only negotiate the lease, uh, but they also know what to look for and, and can help you find properties. Um, and then once you've found those locations, we offer uh, the multi-site comparison, which is using the same data as the area analysis report, which allows us to rate particular properties within the entire market. So we can say, hey, you previously ran an area analysis. There are 25 circles in a standard area analysis. And the three locations that you found uh, after the area analysis would have ranked third, sixth, and 12th best within your area analysis. Um, So uh, how do these locations look relative to the region? And um, both of those reports are using what I'll call summary data since we're sort of casting this wider net. Um, Summary data would be... uh, how many practices are located inside of uh, a two mile radius or a three mile radius. Uh, It would also be things like median household income, median age. When we get into the single site study, which is the very last report, and the goal of that study is to assess opportunity and study um, as most in depth as we can uh, a particular location Once we get there, that's when we go beyond summary data. That's when we're talking about uh, at a two, a three, and a five-mile radius, or a five, a 10, and a 15-mile radius. Uh, The the radii are customized each time depending on population density in the area, as well as the geography. If there's like a big lake or something that people don't cross, 
we'll customize the radii to reflect that. Um, and, and we're looking at segmented data. So um, rather than median household income, how many households at the two mile scale earn between zero and $35,000 a year? How many earn between 35 and 55 uh, and so on? And, and we categorize all that data for all three scales. And then uh, we would be doing the same thing for a lot of the other data, like median age, for instance, breaks down into age brackets. And that can help us uh, not only determine the types of services that might be popular in an area. So if you're in a younger market, uh, maybe it's more family dentistry, even uh, pediatric or orthodontic uh, services are more popular. But if you're in an older market, maybe it goes more towards restorative dentistry and crowns and, and root canals. Um, so that data helps to uh, refine a little bit further. And um, since we're just looking at that one location at that point, is that's when we can really focus in on gathering more detailed data for that site. I think that's powerful. I mean, I mean, it, it looks like you're, you're providing a, a quantitative um, report on how to find your exact location. I mean, this, this is amazing. And I feel bad for any dentist that, that started a dental practice before this was available. I mean, this is amazing. Uh, rather than, you know, throwing darts at a board and saying, I want to live here. I want to practice here. Um, you're, you're telling them that that may not be a good idea or, or this is going to be a great idea. I, I think that you're, you're onto something here. Yeah. Our, our goal is transparency. Um, there are certainly plenty of practices that are going to open probably right now as we speak in really competitive markets. Um, I, I would imagine that new practices are opening in Southern California and, um, major cities, different major cities across the country. Um, and we're not saying that you can't open a practice in Southern California, but we would like at least to communicate, um, that it might be more challenging there than in a different market. Again, not saying that you have to move out of Southern California. Um, but the, We'd like at least the data to be out there so that people know and can decide um, what works for them based on different levels of opportunity. Yeah, no, I think I think you're spot on. I think that um, that you'd be you'd be foolish not not to uh, get these reports to get this information and, and make that informed decision before you know spending X amount of dollars to to make it to make it real um, and. Uh, for any any startup, um, it, it's always a gamble. I mean, no matter what, like you said, no matter what the data says, you know, it may not it may not play out that way. But at least you have the best data available to to know what's possible. And so, so I definitely think that uh, somebody doing a startup definitely needs to do something like this. Yeah. So I, I think it's awesome. I think that um, you know what we provide is a great service, and um, and and I, and I think that. Anybody listening out there should should definitely pursue um, at, at least a, at a minimum, you know, an area analysis to to get the ball rolling. And I think that'd be the first step. And then, um, are you saying that most people do get all three studies when they're when they're getting these reports done? Well, it, it really depends on um, the specific search. In some cases, most people do, or not most people, but in some cases, uh, we do work with doctors who get all three. In other cases, we might say. Um, hey, from your area analysis report, it's really clear that this one market um, is just so opportune for a dentist. Um, and uh, so then they might skip right ahead to the single site study. They saw a couple of properties just in that one area. Um, and then they will essentially say, you know, all three or four of those locations are going to look really good from a market analysis perspective. Um, really weigh the real estate side. Um, and some of those other factors, um, and then come back and um, we'll take a deeper look with you uh, using the single site study. Um, there are other people who uh, may not be in a really densely po in you know a major city or even a, a medium sized city, and they're kind of in a more rural area, and they might start with a multi site comparison. Um, and in that case, what we're doing is essentially comparing scattered population centers against each other. So in these areas, the multi, the area analysis is a grid of circles. Um, but if you were to lay that into a rural area, some of those areas 
might not be all that practical. There might not be really any real estate or that many people um, living in some of those areas. Uh, so with the multi-site comparison, what we can do is say, okay, there are um, in this, you know, within a 40 minute drive of your house, there's kind of five small to medium population centers. Um, let's take a look at those and compare them against each other. Um, so it, it, it always, or it can always be a little bit different. And um, certainly we encourage anybody who has questions about which report makes sense um, to contact us first. You can place an order directly through the site. Um, but we, we are available as well to, um, help discuss what makes sense. And even if, even if maybe it's not necessarily ordering a report right then for somebody who's not ready to order a report, um, we're, we're always happy to, to talk and, um, give our honest opinion about what we think makes the most sense. When most people think about a startup, they think that they are expensive and time consuming. I'm here today to tell you that they are right, but it doesn't have to be. Starting a dental practice presents a list of challenges, but when it comes to making decisions about where to purchase your dental equipment, I recommend Dental Planet. Dental Planet provides affordable, comprehensive services that simplify the startup, expansion, or renovation process while dramatically improving your ROI of the entire project. If you need equipment, Dental Planet has new, factory recertified, and Dental Planet certified pre-owned digital imaging systems. As you know, a lot of your success as a startup is based on your ability to provide a great experience for your patients. The same can be said about Dental Planet. They provide telephone, email, and remote support, as well as multiple financing solutions. Dental Planet is even more affordable than many of their competitors. All products include a warranty backed by a nationwide network of service providers, along with expert sales consultants and technicians. Thousands of more items, including dental supplies, are also available when you use Dental Planet. Buying equipment for your startup doesn't have to be expensive with Dental Planet. You can save between 40 to 60%. See how easy and affordable upgrading, replacing, or expanding can be when you team up with Dental Planet. Just mention shared practices to get a discount on your already low prices. Learn more at dentalplanet.com. Again, that's D E N T A L P L A N E T.com. Again, mention shared practices to get a discount on your entire order. Do you, do you ever put out reports on, you know, what are the best states to open a practice versus the worst? Do you ever, do you ever go through the data and look at that? Yeah. So we offer um, for free on our um, website, uh, an interactive map that tells you some summary data for all 50 states um, we're in the process right now of updating all of that How do you, how do you, how do you locate that, Ken? Uh, it's right on the right on the homepage. Um, there's a map, and you can just click on um, whatever state you're interested in. Um, now, remember that the geography of this data is for the entire state. So while, for instance, in Illinois, we're, we've gathered data for the whole state, um, that may not apply specifically or may not be a good representation, and I would say is not um, an accurate enough representation of what's going on in every individual location in Chicago um, versus Springfield. Uh, so it's a good way to, to start your search if you're thinking about um, a couple of different areas. Um, and like I said, we're, we're in the process right now of updating that um, to 2018 data, and we anticipate that'll be done here uh, in the next few months. Um, and then in, in the future, we're going to be offering some tools that will also help to narrow down when you're starting a search uh, that's really open to anywhere. And um, there will be some better ways to look at really large geographies um, like entire states and, and determine uh, where the best place to open in the entire state of Illinois, if you're licensed in Illinois, would be. That's amazing. So um, someone can come to you and say, I want to practice in my state, but I don't I don't care where. Like, can, can you help mm -hmm. me find that location? So you're, you're potentially be able to provide them with that information? Yes. And, and um, that's something that we'll have available, uh, hopefully not in, in the too distant future. Um, but right now, a typical search, and, and it's certainly, we're not limited to this, but 
Um, a typical search is uh, either a general region like Austin, Texas or uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, but uh, we can absolutely work uh, with somebody who says that I'm interested in uh, – Indianapolis, which is where I live now, but I used to live in Seattle, and my wife is from Boise. Um, we we absolutely work with those kinds of scenarios, and uh, we'll have uh, some new tools to help address those kinds of questions uh, in the future. Very cool. All right, Kent. Well, I want to appreciate. I want to uh, thank you for your time, and, and I appreciate you uh, coming on today on, on the Share Practice Podcast. Uh, I think you're a wealth of knowledge, and you're. I mean, honestly, when I when I see people ask for anything related to demographics, your name, your company is number one. You're the, you're the first thing recommended, and I think you're you're leading the way with with reports that you're putting together, with the information you have, and and your availability. So, I mean, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. I think you're I think you're really helping the general dentists out there. You're helping them um, get that competitive advantage and and find a competitive market. So um, I, want, I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So what is the best way to for people to contact your company? Uh, so if you go to our website, we have contact info there. Um, to make a general inquiry, we have info at dentographics.com. Um, we also have a, a team that can be reached on the website. Uh, so we have a chat feature where if you have a question and you just want to ask real quick, that works. Uh, and then we do also have our company phone number, which is 888-715-1044. Uh, and then for anybody who'd like to reach me directly, my email is kent at dentographics.com. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll definitely put that in the show notes. And once again, I want to thank you for your time and, and, and thank you for what you do. Thank you, Jonas. Hey, not a problem, Kent. Great talking to you. I hope you liked that interview. Kent really, really knows his stuff. And, you know, you can tell with how technical he can get talking about the demographics and where he gets his data and how they source everything. Really, really high quality stuff. And Dentographics is a company that I honestly have a lot of respect for. So highly recommend them if you're in the process of going through your demographic research. Um, now, I think one thing that I want to talk about was you know, the way I would look at it if I was doing a startup and I would, you know, I think some people tend to get excited about a location or start looking for locations before they actually look at the demographic reports. And I think that can be tricky sometimes because your emotional appeal or, you know, you already are visualizing what your practice would look like in that shopping center at that location without even seeing if it's a viable option for a startup. And so I think, you know, what might be a better thing to do is use a company like Dentographics to get an area analysis report. And then once you have your area analysis report, you know what parts of your area you should start looking for practices. Now, the hard part is, well, not practices, you know, available commercial real estate where you can build out your location. The hard part is for startups is a lot of times the areas that have opportunity are ones that don't have a lot of commercial real estate. And so a lot of those good opportunities you'll be finding will be ones that may not even break ground for another few months or whatever it may be. And, you know, that's a great opportunity for you, but you just have to be patient. And I think you'll see in next week's episode, I interview Graham Dursley and, you know, a lot of the things we talk about is a timeline and patience is a big part of it. But nonetheless, you know, try to use your demographics first and then find a location. And then after that, you can start looking into the specific demographics around that specific site. So that was one pearl that I thought um, I wanted to make sure that you guys took away from this episode is the importance of demographics and the importance of making sure that you have strong demographics before doing a startup uh, because that stuff actually matters. It's not just stuff we think about. I think it, it translates into results uh, shown time and time again with a bunch of different startups. So really important to be in an area with a lot of opportunity where you're actually needed and I think that's one of the most important parts of the startup. And I hope you really enjoyed this episode. So next week, we have uh, Dr. Graham Dursley on. And he's going to talk about the timeline of all the things that go into a startup. And it's really going to be a great episode. So stick around for next week. And I look forward to seeing you guys on the Shared Practices podcast.